Alright, what is up, what is up? It is your boy RC Apologist coming in for another episode of the Vantillian Thinker, and I am your host. So, welcome to another episode of the Vantillian Thinker podcast, as we are going to go over a very interesting topic, one that was actually requested by uh, one of the listeners uh, of the podcast. I love the channel particularly, but hey, you know, that's still the same thing, kind of. You know, I mean, that's mostly what this uh, channel is dedicated to making. So, what we're going to go over to is somewhat a bit similar to what we've been talking about for about the past couple of uh, shows on here. And that is the issue about, really, how does the Trinity come involved into our uh, mindset and then thus exploring, therefore, the main fundamental element of our deal, that is, of the... uh, Trinity, since that is we have stated before, that's like the main focus of our philosophy regarding any kind of argument we presented against Unitarianism, as was one episode, the issue about the laws of logic and ultimate authority, how only the Trinity can account for that, the issue of the problem of the one and the many, and how only the Trinity can account for that. So you can see that there is a big focus and emphasis on the notion about Trinitarian theology involved with this. And the reason for that is because the guy that this podcast is named after, you know, that's kind of how his approach in apologetics, the presuppositional apologetic method, was involved with. That the Trinity is not just simply a doctrine that we know, but rather it is a doctrine that is applied in our lives as well because of our knowledge of it. <laughs> so, we're going to go over some of these things um, regarding the matter, and one of them that we are certainly going to deal with is some of the support and the answers of Scripture as stated within where we're going to is the Westminster Divines, that is the Westminster Confession of Faith, and the Westminster Larger Catechism. So, with this, we're going to go into the details here on the matter. So, first of all, I just want to say that, again, it's not the confessions that are ultimately the ultimate authority, but rather it is the issues of the scriptures of which is cited within them. That's what I want people to mostly focus on. Is Today, we're not going to try to focus on a philosophical defense per se. But just simply to note and establish that there is a notion of the Trinity um, in the text of Scripture. Now, what you decide to try to do with that is then entirely up to you regarding the matter of dealing with these particular facts. Because some people, they are going to see it and say, Oh, well, I can't do much about it. We just, uh, we're not going to accept it. Because, I mean, Muslims are going to use that, some of these passages, these days. And because of that, they're going to say, well, you know, this is proof that God is Unitarian instead. And they'll try to twist it with some eisegesis if they try to use that particular kind of defense. Some are more honest and recognize that it is the Trinity and thus why they must reject it as their source of authority. So... We'll have that with, you know, the Muslims, the uh, Jehovah Witnesses, and any other form of Unitarians that try to go against it, and even some others that might not be in that camp, because, you know, you even have some polytheists that want to try to go within this route. But that being said, let's going to go ahead and go into the statements and the scriptural proof therein. So... This comes from the Westminster Confession of Faith in what is referred to as the second chapter, that is, of God and of the Holy Trinity. We definitely know and can agree with the first two statements regarding the nature of God and the idea of the oneness of God. So, we have the oneness of God established and the nature and the attributes of God that are taught. That's not what we're going to focus on, because we already agree God is one. But then we're focusing on the issue about three in one, the triunity of God, Trinity. And in the third statement in this chapter, we read the following simple 
a message. Quote, In the unity of the Godhead, there be three persons, of one substance, power, and eternity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. The Father is of none, neither begotten nor proceeding. So it states right there that God is uh, of none, meaning he does not proceed or is begotten by any of them. So we establish at least in one part what it can be usually referred to as the monarchy of the Father regarding that, but then that will get into issues about the economic trinity and other things that are uh, for another discussion regarding the manner. The Son is eternally begotten of the Father. So we know that the Son is eternally begotten of the Father. And then the Holy Ghost eternally proceeding from the Father and the Son. That is the final statement in that regard. So there we have it in the Westminster Confession, chapter 2, section 3, where we see these statements. Now, we're going to get into the proof text for these things, but just to kind of give a bit of an example or just a commentary on this, because this is with study notes, Westminster Confession, and I want to try to help bring about elaboration about these particular statements that were just made. So, according to J.J. Lim, who is the author of the study notes in this edition of the Confession, he says, It is manifestly not helpful to try to explain the doctrine of the Trinity using earthly and material illustrations, such as the three states of water, the clover leaf, the roles of a person as a father, son, and an uncle, or the sun with its heat, light, and warmth. So he's pointing out here about these analogies that we, tr we might try to use to explain the Trinity based off of what we see in uh, creation. It says each of these tends to promote a heretical thinking to the doctrine such as Sabellian modalism, that is the idea that God turns into three different modes, like he becomes, he's, from, he's the father, then he, be, he ceases to be the father and becomes the son. So he changes his modes like a transformer, which denies the distinct substances, persons within the Godhead. And one of the analogies that was quoted that explains this would be the issue at the states of water. Um, so that would be one particular um, heretical notion of trying to uh, explain the Trinity. So ultimately what he states is that it's never helpful to explain using analogies because then what happens is you teach something that's not the Trinity and try to bring God to not being transcendent, but rather that God is like the creation um, in absolute equalness with creation instead of that there may be some similarities in terms of attributes or characteristics but god is ultimately above all that so that being said what are some of the scriptural passages that are usually utilized here well we're going to go over some of these would be matthew chapter 3 verse 16 now mind you this is regarding the issue of the statement that there is one god and in the godhead there will be three persons so we're going to have the bible software pulled up a bit so just give some time for that but the passage we're going to turn to is matthew chapter 3 verses 16 through 17 and that's where we are going to begin um the reading into the scriptures oops so matthew chapter 3 we're going to verse 16 and this is about the baptism of Jesus. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straight away out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened up unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and, light, and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So we see in this account, and I'll highlight this again and make sure people see. We see right here, that there is three distinct persons that are made reference here. That is that there is the Son, Jesus. We have then the Spirit of God that's descending like a dove and lighting upon uh, the Son. 
Jesus, and lo, the voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This refers to the father. So we can see that there is these reference of the three that are mentioned here. And then not just here, but then you go to the end of Matthew in chapter 28. And you see, and Jesus came up and spake unto him, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now, with this statement that is made in reference here, what you see is the reference in baptizing them, and then it mentions in the name of. So we already could see that there is an evoking of power regarding the issue of uh, name. And in fact, in this commentary on the right side from John Gill, he points out that when it refers to this, especially within these three persons, it is by the authority of these three divine persons who all appeared and testified their approbation of the administration of this ordinance, that is a baptism. And as they are to be invocated, Hated in it, so the persons baptized not only profess faith in each divine person, but are devoted to their service and worship, and are laid under obligation to obedience to them. So, and that's where he goes, hence a confirmation of the doctrine of the Trinity. There are three persons, but one name, but one God, into which believers are baptized. Because we already agree that, you know, the Father is God, so it says, in the name of the Father, so already invoking divine power into this statement. And then it says, and of the Son. Now, here's where the issue becomes. If they've already invoked the name of divine, then it's already going to be a problem to invoke name into something that's not divine with that. Like, you can definitely point this out to an analogy to some of the uh, Muslims or Jews or others that would point out these issues where they don't, some of them might not think this is an issue about the Trinity because you could say, well, do would you say anything to put in the name of Allah and Muhammad in your particular statement? If you're a Muslim, would you say anything like that? And they would give the answer that no, we wouldn't say in the name of Allah and of Muhammad because Muhammad is just simply a created being. He is a prophet. He is just a mere man. He is not uh, God. So that would be heretical to do that. And there is the issue there that they would have to even concede that this would seem to be a notion of trying to put the Son to being divine. And you could say the same thing with the Jews regarding if they would have put uh, the name of Yahweh and then they put in another particular name of, say, for example, maybe a well, highly respected scholar or one of the own prophets like, you know, David and all that stuff, because we believe that David's a prophet. They believe David's a prophet. So the state... In the name of uh, David or Moses or Abraham, along with the statement of the Father, this would be considered problematic and blasphemous to them because they're Unitarians and they only affirm this particular kind of notion. Whereas we affirm Trinitarianism, which affirms the name of the Father and of the Son and then of the Holy Ghost. So we see the three persons are described and taught in this particular work now again this is still just going to the passages stated in the confession of faith with the proof texts and the last one regarding the idea of the three persons stated goes to the apostle paul in second corinthians so go to second corinthians chapter 13 the very last chapter and you go to the 14 the last verse where Paul is giving his, you know, final farewell in the epistle. He says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have the term Lord here, which for the Greek that is utilized is kurios, the same term that is utilized to reference to the Father regarding divine lordship. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, which sometimes the term can be used in application to the Son, but also in application to the Father, and hence it is being utilized here as a synonym for Father, God the Father in this case. So the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. So we have here evidence of what is referred to as the references of three persons. That's all we've proven so far, is that in the Bible we have the reference to the three persons now whether or not you would say or whether or not you would say 
that uh, there's uh, this trinity of three persons described in the Old Testament or if it's just in the New Testament or maybe it is in the Old Testament as well. Regardless of your position on that, we can at least affirm one fact that the Bible does contain this notion about the Trinity, about the three persons. And yet, still the affirmation of Deuteronomy 6.4, where it says the Lord God is one. We affirm this statement, and the Bible also affirms this, including in the New Testament, that there is only one God. So, that being said, let's go into the other statements on the matter. So we have, the Father is of none, neither begotten nor proceeding. The Son is eternally begotten of the Father. Okay, what's the proof text for this? Well, the main thing to go to is just simply the one thing that we're going to get into, but we can get into other divine passages of Scripture for reference that y'all can look up. But for now, read here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay, in the very beginning, before creation existed in the beginning was the word the logos is the greek that is used there so in the beginning was this logos the word and the word was with god and the word was god now remember this isn't referring to the word of god as in scripture but rather this is referring to what is just simply referred to as the term logos which can have several different meanings upon the whole concept but ultimately we can state that it is certainly divine since it says the word was god so i want you to keep this in mind that the word was god now we're going to go all the way down here to verse 14 and the word the logos was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth so this word became flesh and dwelt among us and this is being written by john one of the disciples of jesus and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the father so this word that's made flesh and dwelt among them has the glory that is of the only begotten of the father so he has this divine glory full of grace and truth but then keep going in verse 18 no man hath seen god at any time the only begotten son which is in the bosom of the father he hath declared him so some people want to say that you know this is uh not refer that there's going to be an issue with some translations with this because while the king james says you know the son in the HCSB, no one has ever seen God, the one and only Son, and others would put down the one and only God. Um, so you'll find, like out here in the ESV, no one's seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. So whether you go with the, whether you go with this verse here, who is at the Father's side, the only God, he has made him known. Keep in mind, the only God, and this God is at the Father's side. So we see there's still the reference to deity here. But then we have, of course, King James, the only begotten son, the CSB, the one and only son. So, again, this mostly is referring to when we see these distinction, these differences in translations, because some manuscripts of the Bible will say in the old early church period of 2nd, 3rd, 4th, and 5th century, the Greek would be for Theos, that the one and only Theos, only one and only God. And in others, it would be the one and only Son. So it would use that term for Huos, the Son. But the point still stands. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, the one and only God, which is in the bosom of the Father, or on the right side of the Father. Either way, union with the Father and he had declared him. So we see that it is referred to as God regarding the Son, who is in still union with the Father. He is God, according to John 1 1. He became flesh dwelt among us, John 1 14, and stands by the right hand of the Father or the bosom of the Father, John 1 18. So we have that statement affirmed right there. 
And this is just in John 1, 18. There are other places that talk about the Son being God. We're not going to really go into much verses on expounding upon them because of the time that we have. But I will point out some of the points that are mentioned here in this study notes on the deal. That he has divine attributes. Eternality, 1 John 1, 2. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2 through 3. John 17, 5. And then, of course, omniscience. Matthew chapter 16, verse 8. Chap Matthew 22, verse 18. Mark 2, 8. Luke 5, 22. Revelation 2, 18. So, an omnipresence. Matthew 18, 20. Matthew 28, 20. And omnipotence. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. So, we have here the notion of the attributes of God in the Son. He has divine titles like the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, Isaiah 9, 6, where Jesus is prophesied. Emmanuel, Isaiah 7, 14. Jehovah, our righteous, or Yahweh, our righteousness. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 6. So, we see this notion is clearly there in Scripture. Divine works and offices, identified as the stone of stumbling or rock of offense in Isaiah 8, verse 13 to 14, but yet is referenced in Romans chapter 9, verse 32 through 33, regarding the reference to Christ. He also receives Thomas's worship. And before we get to the Spirit of God to focus out how this is definitely the proof, let me just, because this is an interesting point that not a lot of people really think about, is in John chapter 20, and I'm going to put this up on the Bible software. John chapter 20, verse 28, and then we'll move on. Remember that Jesus in 27 says, you know, he's resurrected, and he's saying to Thomas, the doubting Thomas, reach hither thy finger, behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said, well, that was a bit rude. We've got a little kind of note or update thing on the deal, but hopefully we'll still continue. Yep. So Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God. Now remember, we said, you know, kurios, my kurios, my Lord, same title that's referred to for the Father, and my theos, my God. Now, the lamest objection I've heard whenever I refer to this verse is that what Thomas is doing is he's over-exaggerating like some people do today. They're like, Saying that when Thomas is answering, he's like, oh, my Lord, oh my God. Which would not make sense for a Jewish follower like Thomas because back then, you know, saying things like that was not to be taken lightly to say kordios or theos since these were referenced to the divine. Our culture definitely doesn't take that much consideration sometimes for these particular things. But back then, they were very strict and serious about that. So that's why this cannot apply. I would be reading 21st century context into a 1st century context of a text. And that's just not how you do exegesis. Now, the next passages that we're getting to is in the statement of the Holy Ghost eternally proceeding from the Father and the Son. Now, going to John chapter 15. We're still in John here. Chapter 15, and then we go to verse 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you, Jesus speaking, I will send to unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeds from the Father, he shall testify of me. So we have this here, and pretty much if you start from the very notion of this whole deal about John chapter 15, you're going to see this notion about the Spirit or the Great Comforter. In fact, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, there is even the reference in John chapter 14 to this uh, Comforter. It says, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another Comforter, that he may abide in you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth in you, and shall be in you. So we see that so far we're understanding the interaction of the 
uh, great comforter identified as the spirit of truth in this. And it even says here in verse 26, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to you, to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said to you. And then we're going to go to Galatians. That's the last one in the um, teaching of the uh, confession statement. But there is another one I want to get into. So Galatians chapter 4, verse 6. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So we see that there is this interaction in the promise of the comforter that is in the, in the, uh, the hearts of men that are the sons of God, that believe in God, that affirm the promise of Christ. That's what is there. So we see this. And then another thing. Well, this doesn't prove he's God, though. Well, let's go here. So anyone familiar with Acts chapter 5 with Ananias and Sapphira? And they're being rebuked by Peter for their hypocrisy. But note that what happens here in the statement. <clears throat> after they're keeping back part of the price that they needed to put in for the church. Peter said, <clears throat> Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart? to lie to, now keep in mind here, lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land. Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou was not lied unto men, so Holy Ghost, that's been lied to, to lie to the Holy Ghost, not lied unto men, but unto God. So, we see here that lied to called the Holy Ghost, lied to God. The Holy Ghost and the God and God are sim, are synonymous in this passage. So we have here the identification of God as the Holy Ghost. So we have the Father established as God, the Son established as God, and then we have, of course, the Holy Spirit established as God. So, Hallelujah. So we see in these passages the clear references, and there's several more that we could go into regarding the manner. But for now, what I definitely want to just get into is just some of the proof texts, because we've already gone over some of them, of what is from the larger catechism. This might go over our usual time, but whatever helps get this information out there in its collectivity. Because we're only going to go over three questions. Because there's only three questions in the catechism that goes into the issue about the Trinity. How many persons are there in the Godhead? There be three persons in the Godhead. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And these three are one true eternal God. The same its substance, equal in power and glory. Although distinguished by their personal properties. Because a lot of people want to say, you know, how do you, you know, go about thinking, you know, that there is these notions of God? How do you, this, how can you comprehend this? I'm like, it's just simple. That it's what the Bible teaches. Trying to then put in an analogy or a philosophical understanding about it, that's for later. Just focus on the fact that, does the Bible teach it? Absolutely. You trying to understand it through logic or philosophy comes once you at least comprehend the fact of what is taught in Scripture. And a lot of these we've already went over, but some of them just in brief notion um, that we haven't is the notion of John chapter 10, verse 30 which does point out to Jesus stating, I and the Father are one. So that can be a reference there. Uh, the next question is, in question 10 of the Catechism, what are the personal properties of the three persons? It's proper for the Father to beget the Son, the Son to be begotten of the Father, and the Holy Ghost to proceed from the Father uh, and the Son from all eternity. We've established already what is the teaching on this um, but another one is in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5 through 6 and 8. Where it says, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten of the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. So, people worshiping the son. But unto the son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness, and the scepter of any kingdom, of thy kingdom. So, we see that is in reference there. Now, one that's probably going to introduce some verses that we're going to have to definitely look into is the last question, and that is, question 11. How doth it appear that the Son and the Holy Ghost 
our God equal with the Father? Now, this is the question that people probably are going to ask. How does it appear this way? That the Son and the Holy, Fa and the Holy Spirit are God, and they are therefore equal with the Father in this triunity. The scriptures manifest that the Son and the Holy Ghost are God equal with the Father, ascribing them such names, attributes, works, and worship as are proper to God only. We have went over some of them for the Son regarding these particular attributes, titles, names, works, and all of that. And with the Holy Spirit, we've already looked at some of these passages that are with that. And one of the ones that's interesting to point out is in Colossians 1.16. This is regarding mostly the Son still. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. So when it says him, the context, if you read Galatians, Col uh, Colossians chapter 1, before you get to verse 16, you're seeing the reference to the Son in that regard. So just keep that in mind when we see this. But we also have the Holy Spirit referred to as God with the divine attributes of eternality. Hebrews 9, 14, omnipresence, Psalm 139, verse 7 through 8, omniscience, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 through 11, omnipotence, Luke chapter 1, verse 35, and the sovereignty, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11. We can also get into similar similarities in the divine works and offices. And the fact that, of course, Acts chapter 5, verse 3 through 4, the one we clearly just went over. So, we have demonstrated within this that there is the scriptural teachings of the Trinity. So, is the Trinity taught in the Bible? Well, the clear answer for that is, yeah. So, with this, we can see that the Trinity is taught with one God we only have we believe in one God there's only one being one God but yet three persons three persons in one being one essence whatever you want to use for the term but we know that there we are monotheists we believe in one God but yet he is three persons he is unique in this way and transcendent and unlike anything in creation he is a unique God and furthermore, the evidence of why we need to give him the glory. Because he is the Lord over all. He is the creator of all. And is the sovereign ruler of all of us. Unlike anything we've ever seen. In, hence, even a Trinitarian understanding of therefore the attributes regarding omnipresence. Being everywhere. Being all-knowing, omniscient. Omnipotent, being all-powerful really just makes you understand that there is much more uniqueness than what we sometimes take him for. So, that being said, this has been the RC Apologist. I hope this was very edifying for you. And until then, y'all have a good day. <laughs>